Women are hugely underrepresented when it comes to tech startups, but being prolific users of online platforms is this a missed opportunity in economic terms. I'm now with Baroness Martha Lane Fox, co-founder of LastMinute.com and Britain's most famous e-commerce businesswoman. Well, Martha, obviously women at the top is a huge subject at the moment, especially following the World Economic Forum, where the Coca-Cola CEO said that women are already the most dynamic and fastest growing economic force in the world today. But how do you think women are viewed when it comes to entrepreneurship and startups? It's interesting, isn't it? Because there are actually equal numbers of women entrepreneurs as men. It's just that it tends to be a woman starting a business on their kitchen table or doing something maybe when they've had children and not uh, perhaps scaling businesses to this uh, degree and the extent that you know we'd love to see created out of uh, the UK, let alone from women. Focusing more on tech companies now, and obviously there is an imbalance in terms of women founders and CEOs. A Reuters survey of the top 10 venture-backed startups showed that six do not have any women on the board. Pin interest, for example, that 70% of their users are women and not one woman on the board. So why would you say it's important to correct this imbalance? It's a fact that more diverse boards perform better. You know, the data is now there. There's been endless research from Stanford, from Harvard, from other business schools, looking at boards and companies and comparing share prices, dividends, and all the financial measurements that you'd expect. And we now know that more diverse boards perform better. And interestingly, it's not even the most high achieving groups. So you can take all male groups, all female groups, both very high achieving and you can have a group that is mixed less high achieving and that group will be the best performing group so there's something that happens when you just represent society and represent equality that means there's better decision making and that flows through the whole of uh, the organization now the tech sector is a very very new sector and it was a sector that came out of deep technology people who are programming and coding and for lots of reasons that are more obvious to explain that was mainly a sector created by men so we're partly going through this sort of cultural shift of the tech companies becoming bigger growing up reaching beyond their very deep technical routes to having maybe more marketing expertise represented on the board, more customer facing expertise, finance functions, operations, perhaps areas that weren't so associated so deeply with men. And I think that culturally um, there is still a phenomenon about boards that is more male culturally dominant. So, you know, I'm not for one minute suggesting that boards are overtly sexist, although some are, but there is a kind of latent culture that was created by men, where men feel more at home, where the decision making happens in a more male way, and that takes time to change and break through. It doesn't happen with one board member, it starts happening when you've got three or four that are women. Research from the World Bank has shown how investments in women yield a double dividend. Women are more likely to invest in their incomes in families and communities driving up GDP. So how can more of the world's global economic and business leaders take advantage of this? Any business leader, male or female, needs to look across their organisation and look at equality. You know, it's pretty simple. Do you pay women the same amount as men for the same roles? Do you employ as many men as you employ women? Do you employ as many board members through the whole organisation, whether it's at an employee board or an uh, executive board or a PLC board? Just look at your own house and keep it in order. Putting some really robust uh, and fabulous role models in your organisation, so making sure that board level is represented through to making sure that you're flexible around women coming back to work having had children, making sure that if women are never reaching a particular executive layer, looking at why that might be, doing a proper deep analysis of is there some really quite unacceptable behaviour going on in one particular part of the organisation. Well, you just slightly touched on this, but when you started out, I heard that one of your investors asked you one question, what happens if you get pregnant? Obviously, we cringe when we hear this kind of question, but is this a factor worth considering as, let's face it, a small startup can't really afford to pay maternity? Of course, in a very small business, to have five senior leaders who are all women all go off and get pregnant at the same time, that is a headache and it's not something that's ideal. But at the same time, misrepresenting a founder's belief and passion for wanting to start a business who is a woman as perhaps, you know, them wanting to take some time out at some point in the future, you know, that's completely unacceptable. If somebody's coming to you and they want to start a business, they want to start a business. It's not easy. Um, 
to become an entrepreneur and we should support women to do that and then they will work out for themselves the best way of making that business grow. We should trust people. We'd never ask a man a similarly invasive question. And I also think that you know, in macro global terms, if it's a bit harder for companies because they have to pay a bit more maternity cover, I don't care actually. As a citizen, I think that's really important. I think that we should be supporting women to have those choices, to take time out, just as we should be supporting men. So I kind of take a micro and a macro view of this. We have to really be careful to unpick the arguments and not be too uh, prejudiced about um, small companies and their relative um, ability to deal with these things. I think it's quite an individual thing. What's the greatest challenges then women entrepreneurs face? When you are not the norm, you have to battle to be accepted as the norm. And so, you know, we know it's harder to get funding as a woman. And again, I don't really believe that that's that there is this overt sexism anywhere. It's just a cultural thing. You know, if you work in a venture capital fund where there aren't any women in that fund, because we know the finance sector doesn't have very many women, you probably see a woman coming in and you maybe have some prejudices. Not everybody, but culturally that might be the case. It doesn't make anybody a bad person. It's just the cultural norms, I guess. So there's certainly a lot of issues around financing and you only have to look at the numbers to see that. Well, in the United States, for example, only 27% of entrepreneurs are women, according to Berkeley University. Why is this? Why are women not taking the initiative and starting their own businesses? I wish there was one answer and I could say this is the answer. There's no one answer. It's all about more role models, about um, more cultural uh, change in finance, more cultural change in the corporate sector generally. There's more women needed in the boardroom. There's more women needed at executive director level. We need more female voices in the media. We need more female voices being represented across the entire spectrum. But I think it's shifting, you know, and I don't want to sound like a naysayer. While I'm absolutely recognised that I've had the most incredible experience, all the opportunities in the world, and got immensely lucky, so I know I come from a position of advantage, I do think that progress goes forwards, not backwards, and it feels as though right now, in 2014, we're having more of a live discussion about what feminism means, why equality is important, and why these issues need to be talked about every single day, so I'm optimistic. Let's have this conversation in 10 years' time, and I think we'll be in a better place. Martha, thank you. Pleasure.